This is Jacqueline Lukeman with The Real News Network. The racial wealth gap is finally being discussed seriously in this election cycle and in the country. And some people are even citing the history of slavery, racism, and discrimination that created the racial wealth gap. One of the key factors in the creation of this phenomenon of the racial wealth gap is housing policy. Or more specifically, there is a link between the ability white people have historically had to own property and homes that have accumulated value and created wealth that they were able to pass down to future generations that black people were not allowed to enjoy equally. Joining me to talk more about this issue, some of the policies that created it, and potential policies that could finally tackle it, is Professor Mercer Baradaran. Professor Baradaran is a professor of law at UC Irvine Law School and the author of The Color of Money and How the Other Half Banks. Professor Baradaran, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you so much for having me. I, I love your network and I'm always happy to, to talk to you. Well, let's dig into this topic because there is so much um, and I, I, I want to get as much, connect as many dots as we possibly can. Sure. So I want to start with why should we focus on policies that address the racial wealth gap specifically and not just the general economic inequality that, that all Americans are concerned about? Um, because the areas that are being discussed as economically distressed are, are economically distressed for specific reasons. So could you explain that a little bit? Yeah, I mean, this whole class versus race debate, I feel like is this um, this boogeyman that people say, well, why isn't it everybody? And um, and, and I think we have a, uh, a race-based class system in the US. And so every time you wanna talk about the racial wealth gap, you get a, a cohort of people saying, well, isn't it just class? And by the way, it's the same cohort of people that doesn't wanna talk about class ever. So, so I, I mean, those arguments for me, I think are just um, a way to shut down this conversation. But why, why talk about specifically the black-white racial wealth gap and not generally poverty or generally racism and things like that? And the reason is because we've had an economic system, a housing system, a school system, a credit system that has specifically um, uh, excluded black populations through housing, through student loans, through credit, um, through businesses, from the wealth accumulation of of whites and and whiteness has been defined differently throughout time, and so we can you know go through the history of whiteness, but all of it has been uh, built on an anti-blackness. And so I think we need to talk about the racial wealth gap if we're going to understand any of the sort of anti-poverty movements in this country. We have to talk about the racial wealth gap if we're going to talk about housing or schools or anything like that. You can't understand why we have. Um, the gaps that we do and the inequalities that we do until you understand that it was all based on uh, anti-Black racism and segregation. And, and this racial wealth gap was created purposefully. It was maintained over time through policies that were federal, state, and local. And it is still ongoing and it still self-perpetuates now without added inputs. And I also want to be clear that though I talk a lot about um, fixing the racial wealth gap through housing and through a variety of different policies. Um, I think what is the most important policy thing that we can do is to talk about reparations in a serious methodological way, just to measure the harms done, to look at the theories of justice that would justify uh, solid and robust uh, reparations um, uh, program and, and just start to go down that road. Um, but there are a lot, there's a lot that can be done also just focusing on housing uh, before we get there. And, and you bring up a good point because you, you bring up the discussion of, of reparations and the need to methodically study the harm done, the, the, the impact of the harm done, and the lasting legacy of the harm done, which incidentally, incidentally, or not incidentally, is what the... Uh, 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 House Bill H.R. 40 does, it has been, that has always been the focus of H.R. 40. Um, people mm -hmm. mistake it as a, 
a piece of legislation that's literally going to cut a check for black people. But mm -hmm. no, it is literally to do exactly what you just said, to mm -hmm. um, uh, embark upon the methodical, uh, mm -hmm. scientific, historical, data-driven study of mm -hmm. not just slavery, but the impacts of Jim Crow segregation, red line, all those other things. So that's a great yeah. aside that I'm so glad you brought up. Absolutely. And I think when, when you talk about reparations to people, I mean, I think that they, they want to immediately go to how does it work, right? I see that as step like four or five or six, right? Step one is we need to just catalog the ways in which wealth was extracted, that wealth was um, deprived for these communities, that there was exploitation and exclusion, measure that, measure the benefits to those who excluded and exploited, and then measure the harm. So that's like step one and two. Step three is to look at sort of what are the possible theories of justice? I mean, I teach contracts, I teach contracts damages, and there's a variety of ways that we talk about justice. You can compensate people if you, if you breach a contract, which the US government has breached its contract to the black population over and over and over again, right? Um, they did it with the Native American treaties also, but they have done it with black populations without recognition that they have they had any duties and that they were violated. So what does that breach entail? What? How do you make it right? How do you make a remedy? So when we talk about contracts, we talk about, okay, do you compensate for the wrongs? Do you put them, make them whole? What does that look like? Do you um, look at unjust enrichment? What did you gain unjustly through slavery, through Jim Crow, through segregation? How do you measure that? We talk about all of these other aspects and theories of justice. Just apply that here and say, what does that look like to make people whole for slavery, for Jim Crow, for segregation? And, and, and how do we do that? We know how to do this stuff. It's not rocket science and it's not totally out of the realm of possibility. I mean, you see, um, recently I was at the DOJ and Wells Fargo when it... Um, Wells Fargo, when it gets vi uh, violations for racial discrimination, the DOJ comes down hard on them, takes a, uh, a fee of about you know $7 billion or something like that, and they put it in a pot to be used in the community to give down payments. So this is, it's not exactly like you harmed a certain set of people through racially discriminatory policies, and your remedy is going to be to create a fund of some sort um, to pay back different people, but within that same community. And so we do this stuff all the time in law, and a lot of times in this reparations context, you see people just holding up barriers like, oh, we can't do that, that people aren't alive, blah, blah, blah. And, and that's fine. That's it's not. It's never been a barrier um, before. So that's that's just reparations. Um, back to racial wealth gap policy. I think you you can look at the ways in which the racial wealth gap currently self perpetuates. Uh, so this is in disparate housing, disparate schooling, disparate credit, and to to remedy those different um, segments of the the credit banking sort of uh, economy and and make make uh, sort of lower the gaps. So specifically focusing on housing in, in, in this conversation, because the, it, it has been argued by several uh, experts. I think uh, Forbes magazine has pointed this out. Certainly the study uh, that was published last year by uh, Duke University that, is, uh, that recognized that housing is a significant, or the disparity in housing, is a significant tr contributor to the racial wealth gap because of the way certain groups of people were able to benefit from owning uh, land and housing and other groups of people were not. And as you said, compensating people for harm done has been something that has been done and continues to be done um, when, and, and the example you use when Wells Fargo discriminates against people and the federal government goes after them and extracts a fine from them. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Recently, have there been efforts, and, and by recently, I do mean in the past 40 years, um, mm -hmm. have there been policy efforts to address, even on the surface, the legacy of, of this unequal housing policy? And have they worked, and why haven't they? There has not. There has not been a single active policy to remedy the disparate housing policies. There have been policies like the Fair um, Housing Act that was passed in 1968 to prohibit discrimination against African Americans or other uh, minorities, and and those are fine. But that that's about sort of pegging violations and saying, you know, that's where the the DOJ 
actions come in. It's about enforcement, so stop discriminating. However, uh, as you know, you can make a, di you can have disparate impact in housing. So you can create zoning restrictions. You can suck wealth out of communities. You can segregate, as long as you're not doing it racially, but you're doing it because of, you know, a place, places where you put certain public housing or where you don't allow certain um, sort of uh, building uh, spaces in certain communities, um, then then the, that doesn't uh, count, right? So I think, you know, going back to the original sort of 1968 debate over fair housing, everyone understood that it was either about, you know, you have this, I mean, starting in the 1930s, as you know, about redlining, right? You have just the two different housing sectors. One is tenants, you're paying rent, you're living in an apartment, it's segregated, it's cramped, it is, um, you're, you're just kind of being put in this, in this place, you're not getting a mortgage, you're not getting credit. In the white suburbs, you're building wealth, you're getting credit, all of that stuff. Those things were incredibly consequential. What we've never done is say, okay, we did this race-based housing market, now let's fix it. How do you do that? You either put capital, into the, the segregated black spaces. So that's a reparations program. There's a couple of like core the Congress of Racial Equality in uh, 1968 passed a bill that would create like a World Bank type thing within the black spaces that would just have be capitalized by treasury and just put money back in, right? So this was a, a reparation style thing that, that almost got passed. But then, you know, Nixon obviously you know, puts that stuff away. The other is integration, you know, and MLK's coalition, uh, people like George Romney and Robert Kennedy actually coming up with integration programs. And this would be actually giving people homes wherever they want it, right? Or building nice places within, you know, integrated spaces. And that got shut down quickly by Richard Nixon, who understands that he is elected to, to stop integration, to stop school integration and housing integration. And so what we have today is a housing policy where white families pay to live in all white spaces and have all white schools. I mean, we, we essentially have everything comes down to housing in this country, uh, class specifically, and uh, educational access and social capital and all of that stuff. It's, you know, whether you can buy a million dollar house in some suburb in DC and send your kids to the best schools in the country. And if you can't, you're you're sort of on this different track and your house is not going to gain in value. The schools are not going to be as well funded because the funding comes from local taxes. Um, you're not going to have the social capital because the businesses don't have enough capital to thrive. Um, so all of that, I think it's not just housing, but housing is a root cause and it's all interrelated. Um, so, yeah. So you you brought up Richard Nixon and he's an important I think figure in this conversation because a, a an initiative that that may have begun with him continues to be perpetrated uh, allegedly to address this issue of uh, 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 housing inequality at least or at least um, uh, 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 resolving the issue of of economically depressed neighborhoods right so Nixon introduced this thing called opportunity zones as mm -hmm. in, in opposition to the pro, uh, proposals for economic redress for people centered mm -hmm. around housing. Um, he introduced this idea of opportunity zones where basically investment, private investors would be given tax breaks to invest in these uh, economic, uh, economically depressed neighborhoods. And this has been perpetuated ever mm -hmm. since Nixon. As a matter of fact, the Trump administration has a mm -hmm. new policy um, mm -hmm. that's centered around opportunity zones. Does this work? Does this work to address this, um, especially racial inequality in the housing market? Um, no, and let me be, let me clarify, because I wrote, I mean, the, the my book is centered around this Nixon's uh, idea. and and. He didn't, he was not the first person that called it opportunity zones. He called it black capitalism. And the uh, idea is this, you've got reparations, one group, so the black power groups de demanding reparations, and you've got another coalition demanding integration. And instead he sort of goes the middle or nothing. He's, he's not going to give anything. And what it is, is I will co-opt the language of the black power movement asking for black power. And what they meant by black power is sovereignty, within the black spaces, capital and redress, right? Um, but what, what Nixon meant is we're going to maintain the segregated economy and the segregated housing system, and we're going to do this thing where we, 
try to coax, you know, private entities to come in and build businesses and, and make loans and stuff in that community. Um, so then it, it, it morphs into enterprise enterprise zones uh, in the Reagan era. He calls it enterprise zones. And then Clinton actually doubles down on this. Also, he calls it, you know, er enterprise zones. It used to be called the Black Ghetto um, because it was understood that it was forced segregation. And over time, that turn gets whitewashed and it becomes an entrepreneurship zone, an enterprise zone, an opportunity zone. And so this opportunity zone program of Trump's leads directly back to Nixon. And what it was, was a a decoy from actual policy. It's not capital and it's not integration. Um, it's not real. It is just a way to um, give tax incentives and sort of, you know, goodies to private equity firms to come in and build in those spaces. The community does not get the equity. So it, the best case scenario is gentrification and displacement, right? So the, That's the, the, the best, best case scenario. Case scenario. The best case scenario is that a, a, a community gets revitalized, right? That's the point. And what does that mean? A Whole Foods comes in, Starbucks comes in, all of that stuff. There's no effort to pass that equity onto the people, mm. right? The people who live there. So the best case scenario with revitalization is what happens in Harlem or in Brooklyn. Or, you know, I'm from New York, so we've seen this happen. And, and the, the tenants who don't own the land get displaced. Mm. And the people that gain the equity are the first comers, right? The sort of call them what, yuppies, professionals, um, the the people who can come in and buy and then uh, turn over and sell. Wow. So the best case scenario uh, in in regard to uh, uh, th these kinds of investment in distressed communities isn't a best case scenario for the people who live there. It's a best case scenario for the investors. So all right, this is the, this is what we 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 don't have a lot of time left, but I I need to ask you about your proposal, um, which is called the 21st Century Homestead Act. I, I I want to ask you about why the proposal will work differently from uh, the these uh, this idea of opportunity zones and economic zones and, and private investment that we just talked about. But could you go into really quickly the reason the title is important? Because historically, it absolutely is. Yeah. So I want to make sure, I mean, the Homestead Act was hugely problematic in a lot of ways. One is that it kicked Native Americans off their land. It was um, environmentally not great. And it excluded... Uh, black families. Um, but I'm using this because I want, because it did build white wealth and I want to do it right this time, right? So I, I you know, I think hearkening back to this era of white affirmative action and white sort of um, policies that sort of give white people land and money, right? The Homestead Act and the FHA are two, you know, to, to do them differently this time. And I think that's why it's important to use those terms to say, well, people say, this is crazy. And the response is, well, we did we did this before. Um, we just did it for the wrong, the, you know, we did it for white people and not not everyone else. Um, so, so the idea of the Homestead Act is to revitalize communities, but to give the land to the residents of the communities first. So Baltimore did try to do a dollar homes program a while back. The problem was that the banks wouldn't lend for improvements because the property values were so low and they couldn't get the um, appraisals to come in at anywhere near the price. And so my Homestead Act, um, you would get the land for free and you would get imp improvements um, all provided by a grant um, administered by uh, the federal government and the, and the city itself. And so it would be the, qualifi uh, the qualifying individuals would be anyone who's lived in a red line community for the past five to 10 years, a formerly red line segregated community. I've got a bunch of different restrictions, but we're trying to get at not just the people in that area who have lived there. So we're not trying to target investors, no gentrifiers. It's just the, the locals who live there. You get a home, you get the, the, an improved home and uh, you're paying less uh, than you would in rent. And you get to own the home as it sort of increases in value and you get to have that equity as the place revitalizes. Um, so along with the home, there's also jobs programs. I mean, akin to the New Deal, akin to the FHA, you can't just give people a home and say, okay, just pay for it. There's also got to be a jobs program that comes along with it. So what do you do? So I've got a variety of different um, ways that, that, that cities can create jobs. And, and the easiest way would be to do, you know, what the government already does a lot of, um, you know, VA hospitals and, and energy department loans and things like that. And, and the idea would be to couple one of those projects or facilities with an area that, that gets, that needs this revitalization. So whether it's Baltimore or Detroit, 
Dayton, Ohio, um, anywhere that is a formerly segregated space that still has retained a largely black population um, who, uh, as opposed to like having like, like um, you know, places that were were segregated and, and are now gentrified, right? So places in St. Louis um, where it used to be a black population and now it's all gentrified. So you would actually go to, let's say, Ferguson as opposed to inner city St. Louis. And in, in, within Ferguson, that's where you would do the, the, the handover of, of property. This is really an amazing proposal, not because it's groundbreaking, because it really isn't. Because as you said, Professor mm -hmm. Baradaran, we've done this before. This country mm -hmm. has done this before. It just wasn't done for Black people. It wasn't done for Native people. And we are finally broaching the topic of doing this for people who were left out in the beginning. Um, of course, there's so much more to get into about this topic, uh, but we just scratched the surface today, and unfortunately, we don't have any more time. But um, I would love to continue this topic not just on the urban-suburban uh, focus that uh, a lot of these proposals, uh, whether they worked or not, have, have been uh, geared toward, but also uh, the impact of the same kind of racist policies that have had on black farmers and how mm -hmm. land yeah. value and the accumulation of wealth <laughs> through <laughs> land has also impacted mm -hmm. black people in rural areas. But for now, Professor Baradaran, I thank you so much for coming on today and talking to me about this subject. Thank you so much for having me. And if anyone's curious, there's a lot more information in the book. It's hard to talk fast and cover everything. But I have kind of wrote it all down, and I hope that people find it useful. I am absolutely sure they will. I did. I highly recommend Professor Baradaran's work. I am absolutely being very biased right now as a journalist. <laughs> But I thank you all for watching. This is Jacqueline Lukeman from Baltimore with The Real News Network. Hey, y'all. My name is Tharna Noor, and I'm a climate crisis reporter here at The Real News Network. This is a crucial moment for humanity and for the planet. So if you like what we do, please, please support us by subscribing at the link below. Thank you.